Fast am I. Good afternoon. Welcome to Man in Line on Manx Radio. Halfway through this Canon administration, we're working our way around all the constituencies and talking to the pairs of MHKs that represent them. Uh, Claire Christian was uh, first elected in a by-election and swiftly re-elected in the last general election. Sarah Maltby in first time at the last general election. So it's Sarah Maltby and Claire Christian MHKs representing Douglas South. If you live in and around something you want to talk about, then text, email, call and WhatsApp. And we're on air till just before one o'clock today. So it's over to you. And uh, fast am I. Good afternoon, Sarah and Claire. Hello, hello. Fast am I. Fast am I. Good to see you. So uh, I remember the last time we were all together in this, we were at the Pinewood, weren't we? We did a a uh, a pre-election get-together. So uh, Sarah Maltby, I mean, I have to say, is it what you thought it would be? I did know exactly what I was getting myself involved in, yes. Um, it, it didn't come as a complete surprise. However, there's always uh, complexities and difficult decisions to make, which when you're in the moment uh, can be very difficult. Um, I, it's a huge responsibility being an MHK, one that I do not take for granted any single day. Um, but yeah, I, it's a, I love the job. I love the people that I represent and I can I hope to continue to do so the best I can. Okay, Claire Christian? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's um, it's you have a very very fast learning curve yeah. um, as a, as any new MHK. Um, I I always kind of say every year that goes by, I wish I knew what I knew last year, you know, last year or etc. Um, but uh, you know, as equally as what Sarah said, it's. Um, it really is a real yeah. honour to, to represent the constituents of Douglas South. Um, and, and you know, if there is a constituent who's listening today and doesn't get to ask a question or anything, I'm sure um, both Sarah and I would be happy to answer any questions It's um, a very directly. compact constituency, isn't it? I mean, it, it's pa- everyone's packed in to yeah. a relatively small area. Douglas South is the size of Ramsey, you know, yeah. in, in, in terms of the number of constituents. So, um, yeah, it's it's a very, very compact uh, constituency. OK, uh, let's go to the uh, the phone lines first of all. I think Stephen, hi Stephen, you're live with Claire Christian and Sarah Maltby. Hi, um, St- hi Stephen, sorry, just start again. So, sorry, uh, yeah, good afternoon and uh, good afternoon listeners. I wondered if I could talk to about some of the problems that smaller businesses appear to be having on the island and I do think the island in general, when you go around some of the smaller towns, uh, there is similar problems to probably what the Victoria Cafe is having. And I would say some of them are caused by the cost of energy, footfall, staffing, and the cost of raw materials. Now, what I noticed is we've had an announcement from DOI, the Department of Enterprise, that they want to grow the visitor numbers. But so far, there doesn't seem to be any information of how that will be achieved. Um, also, uh, energy is a is a very big cost, and uh, we've looked at work permit legislation has been relaxed, so that would not appear to be a problem. Uh, from what I've read, the whole of the UK is having recruitment problems. So what I'd like to ask your two guests today is... Uh, in order to help these the, the smaller hospitality shops, cafes, and even the hotels would be helped, would be by growing the visitor numbers, which would in turn grow the footfall or, and the hotels of, of for would solve some of the problems because you could spread the cost over of, of these uh, of these costs over the whole number. But in order to to grow the footfall, surely we would need more routes and some special offers by the steam packet. Now, I believe the steam packet wants to sell the Ben McCree, the passenger ship, citing a number of reasons. But in the past, as you both will be aware, the steam packet did have passenger ships laid up in the in the long winter periods and then running them in the in the summer period. Now, what I'd like to ask you is, do you, would you support uh, the the expansion, I suppose, of the steam packet fleet to achieve this end? Because I can't see any other way of of getting it expanded, because really the Manxman is just on a tramway route back and forward to Haitian. 
So if we are to uh, grow with a visitor economy and have more people traveling here, I would have thought we would need more outport routes provided once again. Okay, uh, Claire so Christian. Interesting... Claire Christian. Th- thank you, um, Stephen. That's a, it's a really, really uh, great question. How do we grow the visitor economy? Um, actually, the, the sea services agreement was actually debated in November. Um, I, I believe Chris Thomas and I um, were, were the ones that kind of spoke up in this debate. Um, one of the points that I raised during that was um, the consideration of the uh, RET, which is the road equivalent tariff. So, for example, in Clyde and Hebrides services, they have seen positive impact um, that from, for lower fares um, for uh, road equivalent tariff. Um, and they have seen about an 11% increase in the passenger numbers, which has obviously benefited tourism and island economics um, and in- improved access for uh, the islanders too. Um, so I agree with you that we want to be looking at extra uh, routes, but also I'm really um, interested um, in seeing the sea services agreement with consideration for road equivalent tariffs for, uh, for passengers. Okay, Sarah Morby. Um, so I recently joined the DFE and so I've been given visit agency as one of my delegations and I'm really pleased with the team that I've met already. They are so keen and so eager to ensure that the island is sold around the world as being the, a top destination. Mm. I'm really confident in their ability and I'm sure that we will be able to hit the target of 330,000 visitors this year. So the visitors are coming. We had 300,000 last year and that is um, they are targeted to beat that um, that that number yeah. there are packages available from the Ironman steam packet granted Stephen you are right we probably could do more that's something that I hope to be able to look into with the steam packet because they do sit on the visit agency board as well when you talked about um, business support the business agency I know have an outreach team that do go out to businesses who find who raise a flag and say that we're struggling uh, we have meetings, uh, DFE meetings and at those meetings all the agencies are represented there and they do feedback the um, comments and concerns from businesses directly to the minister and the department of members so we do hear those concerns and we are trying to find a way to be able to support that agency to be able to support those businesses okay uh, Stephen. well I, i'd just like to uh, have a short reply if i may is would you both support uh uh lobbying speaking and i know the steam packet don't like this but I do feel on the big issues, it is important that the elected representatives try and uh, try and convey the message. And, and, and that is, would you both support the uh, the the Anne McCree being utilised instead of the Arrow because of the ability? And uh, there will be a cost. But as you probably both will remember, when the user agreement was first thought of. Uh, it was done in order to let the company offset their their costs, sometimes unprofitable passenger routes, for having the lion's share of the freight coming to the island. So I'd just like to hear both your views of, do you support the, the Ben McCree being retained instead of the Arrow and uh, using it to try and grow the visitor economy because it would be probably be unfair to uh, give people support with their energy costs and not others. But that is one of the big things I hear, certainly as people I speak to, that the energy costs are exorbitant and the footfall doesn't match the costs. So. Okay, all right. That's Stephen, you asked for a short answer. The answer is yes. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, and Sarah Mulby. Um, I, I've, first of all, uh, I would like to be able to see grow the, uh, the visitor attractions throughout the whole year rather than just seasonal periods first. That would be my first avenue rather than um, jumping straight into the option of the Ben McCree. Okay. Uh, okay. Final words, Stephen? Well, uh, Claire, I'm very pleased with your answer. As Sarah, sa- sadly, I'm not so pleased. I would have thought you would have wanted... Uh, I don't see how you can grow the economy unless you do have another ship so i do hope you will reconsider your answer okay thanks uh, thanks for that Stephen. claire 
Uh, yeah, just Stephen, just on the last last part, obviously, um, being a previous small business owner, I'm, I'm really uh, in tune with the higher input costs that uh, small businesses were, are experiencing and continue to experience. Um, and one of the things that I um, lobbied for in in, uh, in Timwald um, during the tax strategy um, speech uh, debate was um, rates relief um, or reduction for smaller businesses over a guaranteed period of time so that businesses can plan and have room to grow and um, they do this um, in the UK in uh, lots of local um, districts um, and I believe it is uh, you know over a 10-year plan I believe that's something that we should be looking at as a solution something really tangible for small businesses to uh, to to help right now under the current climate. Okay, and Claire Christian, uh, let's just put this in context. And of course, you're a, 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 a former retailer yourself. Retail is struggling. Now, some of the big ones are doing okay. Obviously, the people like Tesco, Marks and Spencer, and what have you. But a lot of retail uh, are, are, you know, a couple of bad months away from going out of business. I've chatted to many people in the business, and they seem to think that government doesn't quite hear this. So what's the answer? I mean, where, where, can, is it up to government to reach out to business or do bus, does business have to make more noise? So, I mean, I, I'm, Sarah's obviously within the de Department for Enterprise, so she could probably update a little bit more on this. But I, what I would say is, is the DfE have gone out to local areas and, and I am reassured by them that they are listening. It takes more than listening. We actually need a plan, a strategic plan for retail businesses. How do we want our high streets to, what do we want them to look like? Are we going to concentrate one area of um, the Douglas uh, City, which is going to be for independents, give them rate relief, you know, get people to those areas um, where they're going to shop for local independents um, and let, leave the high street to the high street retailers. You can, ha you can have um, all the meetings in the world. But absolutely, you can. Something ha has to happen. Something has to happen, and we and that's what I would like to see the DFE taking that information that they've done on their road show as they've gone around the island, taking that information and what fits for Ramsey might not fit for Douglas, and that's another thing we've got to really look at um, what's important for each of the individual towns because we don't want to just concentrate everything in Douglas. We do want to consider Port St Mary, Port Erin, etc., Castletown. Sarah Maltby. Yes. Yeah, so part of the visit agency have just announced that we have a destination board that has just been established which will be doing that exact thing working with local authorities working with businesses within their areas and feeding that all into the DfE to be able to produce and to support the businesses and what the people of the that area want and um, you can ask as many questions as you want but you really need to make sure that the consumer is also getting what they want from their town okay uh, Paul's with us now hi Paul you're live with Douglas South MHKs Hi, good afternoon. Hello, Claire and Sarah. Um, I've just been on the news before about the changing rooms at uh, Spring Valley. My team, Paul Rose Football Club, obviously changed up there with another team, Go Governors Athletic. Two years ago, the building was condemned and demolished. And since that time, uh, the clubs have been getting changed in porter cabins. Within that space of time, I'm, I've actually been dealing with this now for seven years when the uh, old changing room started to deteriorate uh, with the council trying to reach a conclusion, which is obviously we needed them to be rebuilt. We're no further on. I was disappointed at the meeting yesterday. We're going away again and looking at options. The Football Foundation through the Manx Football Association have put a sizable sum of money towards the rebuild. And in fact, that reflects 60% of the available budget. My own club is putting money into it. And we feel sadly let down. Now, Claire and Sarah, because we've reached this point, we reached out to them to say, can you help? And I would like to thank the ladies for getting involved, for showing their concern over what's happening up there in that area in the Paul Rose area, it's a fabulous facility with very with with absolutely um, dreadful uh, changing rooms and so on now. So thank you, ladies. And if you'd like to add anything to what I've just said, I'd be grateful. Okay, just before I, we go to the MHKs, uh, Paul, how long have the have the players been changing in changing in uh, porter cabins again? This is our second season. 
And it's uh, no coincidence that the first two years ago, when we were given the port of cabins, that we lost the team because we had no facilities. The players were fed up. We're hanging in there by a thread now. Um, and in fact, if I could take the chance to just thank the players that have stayed with the club, we're fighting this thing to try and get you decent facilities. But thank you for staying with us. Uh, for those of you that left us, I understand why you did it. And I hope when we get back on a better footing that you'll come back and join us. OK, Sarah Mulby. Yeah, thank you. Um, and hello, Paul. Um, first of all, thank, thank you, you and Mo Posland and the rest of the committee that have t- worked tirelessly to try and ensure that this facility um, is rebuilt. You guys have invested so much time into this place and the, it's more than just a playing field. This is a community that come together invite other community groups um, to the to the playing fields as well and it's really really such a shame that we are having to feel like we're fighting to be able to get back what the club had but obviously a much fitter and much more um, accessible place for more community groups to be able to use so it, it's a real shame that we feel like that we are fighting for this but um, obviously myself and Mrs Christian are there with you and we will be um, with you until we can get this re- resolved. Um, yesterday we obviously we attended the council meeting with you and we obviously heard from Councillor Bentley, Councillor Wells and their feelings on the this topic, which um, seem to um, contradict or be differ to one another. And so we want to see where we can find a way to get people together in one room and to be able to find out what we can actually do about this because it has gone on for far too long. You've been very patient uh, and we're obviously here now to try and support you. OK. Uh, Claire Christian, what's gone wrong? So, um, firstly, th- thank you, Paul, for, for calling in. Um, and, and I really... If I can take this opportunity right now um, to uh, appeal to Douglas City Council and um, to say to them, really please now, can this be put forward as top priority? Um, We appreciate there is red tape to go through. We appreciate there is procedures to follow. um, But this really needs now first priority um, because this, uh, the porter cabins were meant to be a temporary solution, a maximum three years as I understand it. and you know the 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 fields themselves, the the football fields themselves, are essential for this community, for Douglas South. They are smack bang in the middle of three housing estates. And on Tuesday night, when I went down to watch the uh, football match, um, I saw people, you know, um, parents coming out with the kids, etc., really enjoying it. It was a very social activity. Um, some of these players, um, you know, they look up to the older members like Paul, our caller here. Um, you know, it's really important they learn about teams, building skills, all things that the government, our government, say are in the island plan. Um, so it's it's essential that we maintain this. Any, any suggestion that these football teams should be using nobles um, half a mile away is, is not right. We need to keep this. We need to maintain it. And, and both Mrs Maltby and I, we will absolutely do everything. They have our full support. Um, we have also... Uh, we're we're uh, hoping to schedule a meeting with all the the um, uh, we've well, Mrs. Motby and I have requested a meeting. Um, it's it's to be agreed, um, so we can get all the parties around the table um, and actually put together a time and action plan. Um, you know, because if if uh, so that we can get this firmly done and agreed, so that I would hope for next season um, they would have the proper facilities. And one thing that I just want to say, this isn't just used by um, you know, young men, this is used by the Special um, Olympics, you know, the teams, this, you know, and they have really essential needs where they have emergency um, medication um, that, uh, that that needs to be housed in suitable uh, facilities. And at the moment, the porter cabins just aren't, uh, you know, aren't, aren't uh, facilitating that. So this is this is really important that, that and as, as Paul's mentioned, they've lost one team. We absolutely need to get this so that they can start attracting the young people um, of Douglas South into football, um, whether you're a man, woman, whether you're a young young child, you know, we need to get that community spirit back well, the there council, again. The council met in February and they, they the tenders, they said, were too high. So it's, it's too much money. Either they haven't got the money or they don't want to spend it. And they're talking about modular buildings now. 
Yeah, the mod- I've looked into the modular buildings and there are suppliers um, in the UK who um, do, uh, it's normal pro- for them to do modular buildings, which last 25 years um, for these changing room facilities. And they're actually very good. Um, it's a lot of the uh, really good football clubs have them in the UK. So they're not um, just glorified porter cabins. So they're not glorified porter cabins. No, they're not. Um, but obviously there'll be standards that um, that need to be met for the football foundation um, to still, uh, as, as Paul said to still um, give the 60%. Um, so that's what we've really got to make sure because that they're holding us, or oh, they're holding uh, uh, the, um, to, to make sure that we maintain really good changing room facilities. Sarah Maltby? Yeah, I was just going to add on to that. Um, the, the sports fields cannot be used for anything else but um, sports. Yeah. So it's essential. There's no chance of them ever being built the, up. No, they can't be. The, the underground, it's, it's not um, appropriate or, or Oh, it just can't be built on. No, so that they are sports fields or playing fields, um, and so we it's it's so important that that's maintained because if it isn't, if we don't get that changing rooms back where it should be, um, all hooked up and ready to go, ready to welcome all the Special Olympics, the women, the children, and all the adults that um, Mrs. Christian's already referred to, if we don't have it, then that 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 field will just turn into some sort of dump. It'll just turn into places where things are just left, and you know it. People have great pride in this um, this community yeah. asset. And another thing I'd like to add is that it's not just the council who will be funding the changing rooms. There is funding coming from the Football Association. How much are we, how much are we talking about? Uh, from from the Football Association, I think it was 250. Um, the, the the club themselves have obviously fundraised as well to mm. put towards this. And then the council, I think, contributed about 175,000. These are big numbers, and I do accept yeah. they are big numbers. And it is for, But they're proper facilities for proper, proper facilities, football teams. Yeah. Absolutely. That not only um, were promised... The, you know this was this has been like um like Paul says this has been something that has been going on now for quite a long time for over seven years and and it feels like the target rather than getting closer it's just getting pushed further away and it, that I think at this point that's why they've asked um, myself and Mrs Christian if we can get involved to help because it really is quite uh, a concern okay uh, Paul what do you think of what you heard I think the the ladies summed it up very nicely. Um, and, and added to, I, I really didn't want to come on the line and criticise the council. I understand their constraints, but it's just gone on too long now. You know, the, the, we sit down for a committee meeting. We don't feel that we've made any. The, I, I, I'll give a progress report, and it's all been. Um, it takes too long. I, I was getting to the point where I didn't think there was the, the will within the council to to make this happen. I've, I've been told I'm wrong in that, but the, the timeline itself speaks for itself, really. Um, as I say, I'd, I'd like to thank the, the ladies for highlighting a lot of the things I, I would have liked to have said, but there's, there's just so... We've, we've gone over such a long period of time. I mean, we spent money, our own club's money, shoring up the old building. With the help, I must say, thanks to Tony Meppen with that, but volunteers... We spent uh, three weeks in the summer to try and get another year or two's life out of the the old building. That's how far we've gone with this thing. And there's lots more I could say, but I think it took up enough time. Okay. Thank the the ladies again. No, Paul, Um, we really appreciate it. I think everybody understands that they're not just football pitchers and they're not just changing rooms. These are part of history, culture, and everything that goes to support that. So we wish you well. And, Paul, keep us informed. We'll watch the situation very carefully. Howard, hi, Howard. You're live with Douglas South MHKs. Hello, Andy. Good afternoon, Claire. Good afternoon, Sarah. Good afternoon, Howard. Uh, um, Just what is your point of view with the... um, In relation to the question that Stephen asked earlier on about the steam packet, etc., wanting to dispose of the Ben, uh, he said that they used to put ships... They did. They put them in barrel and places like that for the winter. But uh, they had 11 vessels then. But at that time, they were carrying the freight, lift on, lift off. They had the uh, freight berth just down below the, the lifting bridge, as we call it now. So... To get rid of the Ben, um, it seems, I don't know, there seems to be the government working one way and the steam packet pulling the other way. Neither one of them seems to want to work together. The Ben, 
there was quite a few of those vessels built, and the Condor Line, down in the, the south of England, where they're travelling through to Jersey, Guernsey, etc., they have just bought a sister ship to the Ben and brought it within their own fleet. And here we are trying to get rid of the vessel that can be useful if and when the Manxman goes in for servicing because of, um, they're talking about getting rid of the fast craft eventually, changing that. But that is very restricted in the weather it can sail in. The steam packets seem to be primarily interested only in freight. Um, and the passenger service seems to be secondary. But this, again, I think is simply because the steam packet are running it and the government own it, or the people own it, and there seems to be a conflict of opinion. What is your view on um, the, the steam packet disposing of the Ben and keeping the arrow? Okay, uh, Claire Christian. Thank you. So um, in answer to um, uh, the question that you've asked, um, I absolutely do think, uh, certainly in the foreseeable future, we do need to keep the Ben. Um, I think w what's really important, you you talk, touched a little bit about what government wants and what um, the, the Isle of Man steam packet wants, and it's two different things. And this is why it's essential that the sea service agreement is is really put on a top priority for the DOI to resolve so that we can, or the government can, and certainly as backbenchers, um, Mrs Maltby and I, we can lobby for things like this to be in the sea services agreements to assure that we have that security um, and uh, and that it isn't just a freight in for interest in, and we do look at the passengers as well. Um, and, and, you know, just reaching just a little bit further about how... Um, the sea services agreement at the moment is lacking any kind of support for lower freight costs for banks registered businesses so I'd really like to see that um, to help support and that could help drive drive the business and, and the need for the Ben McRae. Okay Sarah Maltby. Yeah um, I, I, I think my, my point was maybe not explained very well earlier when Stephen asked his question. Of course the Ben McCree is very important but when you conflate it with visitors, I think visitors need to be coming here all the way through the year and not just at sort of peak times and so that's what I was trying to say was um, you know, I would like to ensure that we can grow the visitor economy throughout the year and not just at peak season times. The Ben McCree is an important asset um, it does seem to be up in the air at the moment, we don't seem to have a real idea of what the steam packet is going to do with it. This is one of the issues with the steam packet not being um, able to be FOIable, I suppose. You don't get to hear uh, and uh, get those questions that you would like to be answered. I mean, what's your opinion of that? Because the public don't quite understand why the steam packet, our company, <coughs> Treasury shareholders, is not FOIable. Yeah, and I'd agree with that, to be honest. Um, that is something that I think would um, certainly help. I, I do think it's quite um, difficult each week when we have lots of questions coming through from backbenchers to the Treasury Minister or to the DfE Minister asking questions about the steam packet and clearly they're just reading answers out that they've been given. Yeah. You know, it would make far more sense to me if you could actually ask um, the, the company itself. Yeah. It, it just prompts the suspicion that they're hiding something, which I'm sure they're not, but it, it prompts the, 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 the image that we're not worthy. We're not worth the information. Um, I don't think that's what I think the steam packet does. I think the steam packet does what they've been requested to do. You know that the legislation and the agreements are in place are as they are. Um, it's it's just one of those things that will obviously need to be addressed, and it's been addressed. It has been spoken about already recently, and it's something that that is um, on people's minds. Okay, fine. Uh, Claire Christian. Yeah, can I just just add to that? Um, I think just. You know, when we're looking at arm's length organisations and the misconception that has been built up, certainly in the last administration, I mean, I heard debates, I wasn't an MHK at the time, but I heard debates by um, ministers saying, you know, the, the, the steam packet's ours and, and this is, you know, it's this is a really good move for us. We'll be able to control it. It doesn't feel like that right now in this administration. It feels very much like the arm's length, it, it's now a political, it's not our problem. Um, so what 